First of all, I want to thank everyone for being here, and uh, we're delighted that the Honorable Congressman Danny Davis has uh, been able to stop by for a moment. Uh, as you know, Congressman Danny Davis is the co-sponsor of this event, and we're just absolutely delighted that he could take a couple of minutes. He has to leave quickly because he has a vote, but he did want to step by and say a few words to, uh, which I know here in this audience is a very distinguished group of policymakers and legislative people, and we're so delighted you're here. So, Congressman Danny Davis. Thank you very much. And let me just say, first of all, any time you've got a full house, no matter what size the house, you're doing all right, you know, because it takes four of a kind <laughs> to, 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 to beat you. Let me say that I'm delighted to be here and to see all of you. As a matter of fact, uh, I just finished reading a letter from the son of a gentleman who was 110 years old on Monday, and he wanted a little acknowledgement of his father just in terms of him having lived to be 110. Most of us don't have that experience, but what it reminded me of is the tremendous advances that we have made over time, how different things are now from what they were when he was born how many advances we have made, how much we have learned, and how much potential there is to keep learning. I also recall that one songwriter said that our children are the future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Our children have so much potential that sometimes is not explored because we have not learned how to really ignite it, how to excite it. I recall teaching for a few years before I decided to do some other things. And I taught at a school where the children were overaged, had emotional difficulties and all kinds of problems and all kinds of needs. And so I went out and took all of the courses that I could take related to the difficulty of teaching disadvantaged children. And as I began to apply that, what I had learned, it opened up a whole new world for me, that I discovered things that I just didn't know. And once I applied what I had learned, then I had a better understanding of how to deal with my students. So I think that research and development have always been a tremendous part of making a different world. I also recall when many of the things that we deal with today, uh, people thought they were fiction. They were fiction. <laughs> until the exploration. <laughs> now I understand that people are making reservations for Mars. <laughs> <laughs> and they're paying the money up front so that when the time comes that we're there, that they will be first in line or they'll be able to get there. So I really don't discount anything. I don't discount any possibilities. I don't say that anything is out of the realm of what can be, but I think in order to find out, we have to explore it. And that's exactly why we are here today. And as a person with strong educational interests, I think it's very important that we hear about every kind of initiative that is taking place. Uh, so this briefing is an effort to share with you the work of Brainware Safari to integrate research on how we learn to design software to improve learning skills and student performance. I can tell you if we can find a way to do that, Many of the nights that I spent agonizing, because when I taught, I was a very serious teacher. And I thought that if teaching was taking place, learning should be taking place. 
And there were times when I doubted my ability to make that happen because I wanted my students to actually achieve and be successful. And I felt that if they were failing, I was failing. And I didn't want to fail. <laughs> and I think if we have young people who are not succeeding because we haven't learned how to make sure that they do, then they're not just sailing. Society is failing, not just the individuals. Because as we end the celebration of Martin Luther King's birthday, you know, King was of the notion that all of us were extricably bound, that we were tied together, that we were shaped and molded and the success of one individual added to the success of the whole society. And so I really commend and compliment uh, researchers, people who are trying to uncover that which is not known. And I trust that this briefing is going to be uh, of interest and stimulating and successful. I'm delighted to help co-sponsor it or get this room and see rooms filled with people, it helps me to feel that there's more possibility than oftentimes we recognize. So have a good morning. I'm going to go over and cast my vote no. And uh, <laughs> it's good to be here. That's certainly a motivational start. Um, we're going to talk about a number of things today, but it's really about the student. The first thing I'd like to say to the group is that so often, in, in, especially up on the Hill, it's, it's about cut and eliminate or tax and spend. And that seems to, on every issue, where everybody seems to line up. Today, what we are hopeful that we're able to convince you that perhaps there is another option. We'd like to put another lens on the concept of tax and spend and cut and eliminate. For we think there are other ways to take what we already have, not spend more money, but reevaluate how we spend it. And we'd like to put the lens on the student today. So often education reform is focused on new buildings, new computers, more technology. Now we're talking about elevating teacher proficiency. Everything's about the external issues. And I think today I read something that the shortest distance for success in reality is eight inches right between those two ears. A lot of people are fearful to approach that subject because you can't see it. We can see technology. We can see a building. We can see a teacher. But we can't see what's inside here. And traditional education, where you've gotten your degrees today, those that have been in education or know about education and teachers, they do not typically teach about neuroscience and cognitive development in getting their teaching degrees. That's going to be soon to change, but that's where the situation is today. So we're hopeful today we can share some insights. We think there's been an enormous amount of research. There needs to be more research. And uh, we're going to, to be asking here on the Hill that uh, we do not need more money, like everybody else that walks in here, but we need to look at how we're spending that money, and we want to make it easier for our administrators at the teaching level to be able to make the decisions on the ground, in the battlefield, as they see the need and make the call. And the educators I know are not afraid of accountability, but if you're going to make them responsible, give them the control, and that's going to be our message on the Hill. So without further ado, let's just kind of step up. There, I think there's to, for us to take this journey today, there's really four things that are a confluence of four things, if you will, that are coming together that this, make us, this makes the perfect time to begin to deal with some of these issues. Number one, there's no more money. The party's over. Every state government, every federal government has been pounded and beat it. Every time there's a problem in education, just give us more money and it'll fix it. Well, that hasn't been the case. Um, I can't speak for every state, but I was just looking at our state, the state of Illinois. Um, I often like to talk about educators, or they could teach Wall Street a great deal about the manipulation of numbers and how they work their students and so forth. But the reality is when you cut to the chase in the state of India, a state of Illinois, regardless of what is being said and, and talked about by some of the administration people, is that less than a third of our children 
can read at fourth grade proficiency level. Less than 12% of our African Americans can read at a proficient level at fourth grade. Less than 17% of our Latinos. Now, if that's not a lightning strike moment, I don't know what is. But it's time to talk about the facts and quit sugarcoating all the stuff that we hear every day in education. And I think there's an opportunity here to do that. But the second thing that's coming together is accountability. Well, you're going to hear today from a school district that was able to take a non-performing school district through the contribution of neuroscience in the classroom in a very specific way, a highly comprehensive, integrated approach in the architecture of how we build cognitive skills. And they were able to go from a non-recognized school district in the state of Michigan to the seventh highest performing academic school district in the state of Michigan. To me, that is accountability. Today, there's a big effort focused on teacher proficiency. It's a real challenge in how we watch all the different measuring tools and the subjectivity that goes into measuring what a teacher is doing. But I know this, and I've seen it. What would you do to teacher proficiency if you filled a classroom full of students better prepared to learn? For I don't know about you, but I think most of us would agree, preparation is number one in anything that you intend to do, if you intend to do it well. It's all about preparation. Unfortunately, as many of you know, not all of our students come to class from a highly proactive, stimulating, involved, engaged family life, ready for great teaching and great curriculum. So we're going to talk about how we build that capacity and deliver a student to the classroom that's better prepared to learn. And the fourth issue is Common Core. You hear a lot about Common Core. As we look at Common Core today, we like a lot of the things that we're seeing in Common Core. We like the fact that they're saying, hey, this is about building people that have the ability to perform outside of school not inside of school, it's about outside of school. Are we preparing them for productive jobs in the workplace? And another thing else, they're talking about building thinkers and problem solvers. And that's what cognitive development can help us do, probably better and faster than anything else we could do with those that are most challenges and are not processing information clearly. Because not everybody listens and hears the same way. So let's take a look at what's happening here. This is not me talking. It's not really relevant what I have to say. But some of you may be familiar with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. They just came out with their big research report. They do this every, I think, 10 to 15 years. And they've been up on the Hill. Some of the best minds that we have to offer put this together. And what they say very clearly, uh, the PISA scores, many of you may be familiar, most of you probably are. I think they were developed. It's a, it's a rating standard to how we rate internationally in the performance in reading and math around the world. And as you probably know, uh, the, the statistics says we don't do quite as well as, as we would hope that we would do. Uh, we could argue about the PISA scores and, and peel that back layer by layer, but we won't do that today. But for the sake of discussion, they say if we can deliver and elevate our students' performance ability on the PISA scores to the mean score, now hold on to your seats. You're going to hear a lot of data today that you're not going to believe, and I don't blame you. Be skeptical. $72 trillion worth of GDP, GDP will be under $72 trillion. The whole world's only $65 trillion. Everything they're talking about on the Hill up here becomes irrelevant. We're only $16 trillion now. We uncover $72 trillion worth of GDP. If we do that, we don't have any other problems. So when the President spoke about let's have faith in America, and when the Congress said that lies with our children, that is the key to every issue we're talking about on Congress. We get that right, ladies and gentlemen. And we're going, we've got a home run. Now, what is the number one challenge that they say in this report, and you can all have a copy of it, of why we can't get there? What's the number one obstacle? You know what it is? They lay it right at the foot of lack of cognitive development of our students. That's it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about that obstacle and how we can work through that. The second group that's had an opportunity to weigh in on this subject is, is NCAT, NCAT. Most of you probably know this. This is the accrediting body that if you get a teaching degree, has to accredit a university or you can't get a teaching degree. They just came out with a report, I think, what was it, 2010. It's called The Road Less Traveled. And in that report, they lay right at the top. If educators do not begin to incorporate the cognitive, excuse me, the developmental sciences in the classroom, we will never close the achievement class. End of story. Now, cognitive is only one developmental science, but they say the developmental sciences collectively. And at the end of that story, at the end of the report, they start to lay out recommendations of what they think needs to be done, policy recommendations. And they also get into discussions why educators have been reluctant to accept and adopt working on this within the classroom. So this is not me. These are bigger groups than me talking about the value of what we're talking about. You recently heard a lot about 21st Century Schools Initiative. Um, 
a lot of us in education say that's just a pig with a different color lipstick of what they're trying to say. Uh, Ken Kay, I was talking to him about this. I said, I hear all this stuff. It all looks beautiful. It's got a nice chart. But I said, you're forgetting one thing. And I said, the student, cognitive development, neuroscience. You talk about building problem solvers. You talk about building thinkers. Yes, this will work if a, a child is fully developed and all their capacities are working really well. But what about the students that aren't working well? This will never work. We want to focus today on the student. We think the student is the most important factor in any educational formula you want to put together. And it's time to change the discussion, the discussion to focus on the student. So that's kind of a brief overview. Let's talk a little bit about this first speaker we're going to have today. I'm delighted that, uh, just so you know, no one is paid. Everyone paid their own way. Everyone paid, to, they're not paid to get here. This is something they've done out of their love and their respect. You need to understand that. Dr. Patricia Wolf, uh, uh, is considered one of the world's leading authorities on brain-based research and how that applies to classroom initiatives and outcomes. She's written a number of books. She's an author, a lecturer, speaker. Her most proud credentials is the fact that she was a teacher and an administrator in education. She spent the last 35 years of her life dedicated to the concept that the child is worthy of our time and we need to look at what brain research tells us. And I'd like proud to call her my friend and a wonderful human being. And I'd like to have a nice warm welcome for Dr. Patricia Wolf. Thank you, I think, Roger. Um, I often joke that I've been in education since the ice was melting. Um, about 43 years, I began my career as a teacher. I've taught every grade level. I was very poorly prepared to teach. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, intuitively, most teachers do a doggone good job. The problem has been is that we have an educational system that is based basically on the psychology of behaviorism. Now that's changing. Now you all know what behaviorism is. Who comes to mind? Anybody? Skinner, Skinner right. And so Skinner put these little pigeons in boxes. They were very hungry. He had um, well-motivated students. And um, they're not fed. And so what pigeons will do, they'll peck all over the place and try and find something to eat. And there's a lever in that box. And if they hit the lever, they get a pellet. Well, it doesn't take long for the pigeons to learn that you hit the pellet and you get food. And Skinner said, that's all we really need to know. All right? It's positive reinforcement. Well, I'll tell you that I had kids I was trying to teach to read. <clears throat> and I could positively reinforce them out the kazoo, and they didn't learn to read. There had to be more than that. So we're looking at a, a new scientific foundation for the educational field. Of course, it includes positive reinforcement. We all like to get you know, good grades. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that grades do not tell you whether or not the students truly understand the information and whether they can use it in the world outside of school. Because our job isn't really to help kids do well in school. It's to help them do well in life. And as you know, we've entered an information age you know, where information is, you know, they'll probably get better information off the internet than they will out of any textbook because by the time a textbook gets out, published and adopted, it is, it is outdated, right? So we have, we have a potential for a new science and it's called neuroscience, which I think is going to provide us with a much better understanding. So can I have a brain up here? Okay, this is an autopsy brain. And this is all we had to work with. Now, you can't tell anything by looking at this brain. You don't know what the person's uh, gender is. You have no idea whether this person has autism or ADHD. You don't know what the IQ score is. That's all we had to work with. So nobody paid any attention to brains. It didn't help us, all right? What has happened within the last couple of decades, we have learned more about the human brain than in all of recorded history. And that is due to brain imaging. So let me show you an example of brain imaging. This is called a PET scan. And they inject into the bloodstream radioactive glucose. Now glucose is the energy source for the brain. And then they can put the person in the scanner and ask them to do different things and see which part of the brain is using up the most glucose. This one happens to show you uh, in the upper left a person who is reading or looking at a word. We now know that the visual system of the brain is right back here. That's why when you bump the back of your head, you see stars. 
okay? Um, we know that when you're listening, another part of the brain takes over, and that's in the side, what we call the temporal lobes, okay? We also know <clears throat> that when you are generating verbs, all right, or words, another part of the brain takes over. And when you are speaking words, a part of the brain called the motor cortex takes over. Now, this isn't particularly helpful to me in a classroom, but let me go back to reading for a minute. Um, about 70% of my students learn to read, I think in spite of me, because I didn't know what I was doing, but they picked it up. 30% didn't, and that's nationwide, incidentally. What did I do with the other 30%? I did the same thing I did with the 70 over again. It hadn't worked the first time, it didn't work the second time. I literally did not know what to do. Now if you look at the work of Dr. Um, Sally Shaywitz, she's at Yale. There's another imaging, it's called a functional, have any of you ever had an MRI? Okay, all right, so a functional MRI not only shows the structure of the brain, it shows specifically where it's happening. So what she did was she took a group of dyslexic kids and incidentally, many dyslexic kids, most dyslexic kids are very bright. Right? It's not a matter of IQ. Then she took a group of kids who read well. And she puts them in this functional MRI scanner and gives them these tests. What she discovered is there was a part of the brain in the dyslexic kids that wasn't activated when they read. And it happens to be the part of the brain that allows you to decode words, to sound them out. Well, if you can't sound out words, you'll never learn to read. All right, so you've got this whole group, 30% of these kids who can't do this. Takes them out, puts them in a very specific phonics program. Now, not your grandmother's phonics with the worksheets, but teaching them very specifically, no matter what age, how to decode words. And listen to this, puts them back in the scanner, and she has activated that part of the brain. So this is where we're going. Now, we don't have all the answers, for sure. Um, so what is learning? What is learning? Well, learning is a physiological act. You are, your brain has about 300, um, about 100 billion brain cells. They're called neurons. And they connect at what we call synapses, all right? So your memory is in a synapse. So people with Alzheimer's, they lose their connections and lose the memory, right? So what they discovered is that learning is a matter of making and strengthening these synapses. Okay. Then what is memory? The memory is the ability to be able to reactivate a connection you made earlier. Now, how many of you took a second language in high school? How many of you speak it fluently today? Do you teach it? No, okay, you're, the, you're an unusual case. Why don't you speak it fluently today when you took two, three, four years in high school? These connections, if you use them over and over, will stay. If you don't use them, what happens? They fade away. I remember I was a straight-A student, and I took chemistry. And today, all I remember from chemistry is the boy who sat behind me, because he was really cute. And he used to tap me on the shoulder and say, you make my heart go pitter, pat. That's really bad. Okay. <laughs> That's all I remember from chemistry, and that's all I remember from almost all of my courses. Now I want to show you um, what the, the scientists, the neuroscientists, this is their mantra. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Now they don't actually wire together. It's a chemical reaction. But what we're seeing is the brain learns what it does, and the more you do it, the stronger becomes the connection. If you don't use it, it's gone. I don't care what the grade was. All right. This is an amazing picture from the lab of Dr. Marion Diamond at UC Berkeley. And on the left, this is actually, both these children died or we wouldn't have this, unfortunately. But on the left, you have a piece of the outer layer of the brain, which is called the cortex, in a newborn. And on the right, you have a two-year-old. You've got a picture of learning right there. Now, actually, that two-year-old has too many connections. It's called the terrible twos. <laughs> yeah. Now what the brain's going to start doing now is it's going to prune away the connections that that two-year-old isn't using. And this is happening in your brain right now. You will walk out of here with different connections than you walked in with. Right. And if you keep this, if you work with it, it you, you'll remember it. But two weeks from now, if you don't look at it or listen to this information, guess what? It'll be gone. Okay.
Um, I want to just very briefly give you four. You're getting an, um, a semester's worth of neuroscience here in 10 minutes, so you know, bear with me. I think the four major findings, number one, probably above anything else, is called neuroplasticity. The brain is the only organ in the body that you change minute by minute by minute. It's neuroplasticity. It's malleable. You can change it. The brain you're born with is not the brain you're stuck with. Okay, I just read a report that there are some children with autism through um, certain methodologies are getting rid of the autistic diagnosis. That's absolutely amazing. But let me tell you this. What if a baby was born blind? None of these neurons back here in the visual system aren't working. There are 300 million neurons back there. What do you think is going to happen to those neurons? They never get activated. You think they'd atrophy. You think they'd die. They don't. They change their function. They become auditory neurons and tactile neurons. This is why people who are born blind have a better sense of hearing and tactile sensation. Also, new recent research shows that children who are born deaf have better peripheral vision. So the brain is changing on its own based on what you're given. But the job of the educator is to make the right connections and keep them strengthened. And we're not doing a very good job of that. So that's the first one. The second one is the brain is a pattern-seeking device. And basically what that means is if the information doesn't have any meaning to you, if you can't hook it to something you already know, it's gone. Um, a friend of mine calls it educational bulimia. You just suck it up, regurgitate it on the test, and it's gone. All right? um, I took many courses that fit into this model. One was called statistics. <laughs> yeah, okay. The third one is that emotions play a much stronger role in learning than we have ever realized. And you can tell that by looking at cortisol levels in the brain. When you are under strong stress, the frontal lobes of the brain shut down. They don't work. Frontal lobes are the part that lets you do your higher level thinking, you know, the, um, all of your problem solving. It's right here. When you go under stress, they shut down. Now, how many of you have ever been insulted and could not think of a retort till the next day? That's an example. In the classroom, if the student perceives this classroom, or his or her peers, or the teacher, or parents to be threatening, they don't learn. Now, we know that classrooms need to be more physically safe, but they also need to be more psychologically safe in order for learning to take place. Uh, the fourth one is a very, very important one. Most people don't know that you have two very different types of memory. One is memory for things that we say have gotten to the level of automaticity, okay? So you don't have to think about walking, and that's good. Because if you had to decide which muscles to use, you'd never get very far. You've done it over and over and over until it's reached the point of automaticity. We call this procedural memory. It's a memory for a procedure. That's where reading gets where most people are, your ability to play a sport, a musical instrument, your ability to write is procedural memory. And the way you practice that, the way you have to practice that, is by doing it over and over and over in the same way. You know, we don't want creative car driving. You better drive it the same way every time. But the other type of memory is not helped by repetition. All right, and it's called semantic memory. And this is the memory for your concepts and we need very different strategies for teaching concepts than we do for teaching kids to read or to write. Right? Um, so we have a whole list of what we call brain compatible strategies. Let me give you one example. How many of you have ever taken a history class? Was it a really fun class? Yeah, yeah, okay, it wasn't for me. Um, <laughs> taught by teachers who are so excited about it to students who are not. Anything past yesterday is ancient history to most of today's teenagers. All right. So we have a program, there's a program out where the kids act out historical scenes, where they sit on the floor with their chairs turned upside down in trenches and they're writing letters home during World War I. And all of a sudden, high emotion, high learning. All right. 
So we need to look at very different. So I'd like to just finish, and this is it, by saying that we are really standing on a threshold, a threshold. Neuroscience, brain research, is, is, has the potential to make tremendous strides in teaching and learning. I'd love to go back and start over again, okay, with what I know now. Right. And I think how we use this information, this neuroscience, and a new foundation, if you will, of scientific for how people learn is probably the most important question that we're facing today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wolf, uh, for that. Uh, it's a very brief overview. As you said, that's probably a semester or more, and I think you're going to find that out today. The things that we talk about, well, most of us have spent, uh, I've been spent over 10 years myself, and some of you have been this 20 or 25 years. The next speaker that we have is Dr. Sarah Afton. Doctor um, is um, with Damon College out of New York City. She's the chair of the Early Childhood Special Education Master's Program, and we're delighted that she flew in today. She has a big go because she not only runs a chair of the university, but she also is a mother of four children, so she's got a full deck. And I'm, I'm always proud of this language. She speaks four foreign languages. Isn't that amazing? And she does it really well. So uh, what she's going to talk about today, the next question that each of you should be asking yourselves, okay, I get it, there's something going on here, but is there any empirical evidence of what this can do in the classroom? That would be the next question. So she's going to talk about some groundbreaking research that's never been done before in the history of public education and how we deal with students with SLD. As you know, we typically, it's about 50% of the special education population. We develop accommodations, we develop workarounds, we don't expect much, we don't get much. It's actually one of the biggest and most expensive and challenging populations that we deal with today in public education. And we're here to suggest that perhaps there's another lens to look at that population. Doctor? Thank you very much for this wonderful introduction, but I'm just going to make a quick correction um, okay, about being the chair, just the director of the Early Childhood Master's Program in Education at Damon College. And I do love Dr. Barry Fox and Dr. Liz Wright, who are both um, the dean and the chair, and okay. they're wonderful, and that's wonderful. No, that's great. It's just, um, you know, politically correct information. <laughs> So it's wonderful, and thank you so much for um, introducing me as a mother of four children. With that, I'll say that um, I strongly believe in those foundational skills that happen at the early age. And yes, neuroscience is telling us that learning is happening at any time, and it's not just sitting there. But yes, those cog the foundational cognitive skills are key. And I think I'm going to build on that today. Um, there, my goal with the remarks I'll make today, actually, are based on a strong sense of urgency. And I know you've heard um, a wonderful presentation from Dr. Wolf, and it's keying us into um, an understanding that we are traveling or we're moving towards a new era, perhaps an era that's slowly becoming known as the era of educational neuroscience, where um, educated practitioners, like so many of you standing here, are actually talking to uh, scientists who study the brain, who study brain imaging, and are forming a certain type of dialogue to perhaps connect each other to better inform teaching. And that's my sense of urgency today. Two premises underlying, underlie the urgency I feel. The first one is this importance of the cognitive skills to the learning process. Um, I believe that what we're doing today with the children who struggle in the classrooms, as many of us have witnessed, is highly improvisational and perhaps based on a lot of trial and error, when in fact there is an increasing awareness of the connection between cognitive skills and learning performance or learning uh, achievement. And that has been growing for the past 20 years. Um, many educational researchers and other types of scientists have pointed or recognized the importance of uh, targeting cognitive strengths and weaknesses. Flanagan and Harrison actually have the quote up there, say educational interventions that address cognitive processing limitations may be key to improving performance in academic areas where learning difficulties are manifested. That key aspect is really what's touching my heart. It is the, it's those suggestions and other research efforts that have brought me here this morning to actually raise the awareness of the need that we must add the training of basic foundational cognitive skills to our educational system in the U.S. 
coming from the, from the field of education, I actually acknowledge that until the very recent past with the explosion of neuroscience research, we perhaps did not know better. Accommodations, modifications to the environment, to the curriculum, and, and good teaching are what we train or are still training our teachers in order to increase students' performance. I'll give you an example. A, a child who has an attention uh, control issue, we may break down the lesson. We simplify the task. We remove all distractors. And we even color code the worksheet that he works on or the textbook. But cognitive deficits, especially like issues with attention control, don't disappear. There actually are the barriers for the children to learn. And they form those um, limitations to impede in the quality and the pace of learning. It's time that we add to accommodations and modification the understanding that we're collecting from other disciplinarians. And, and today's meeting is actually one that I call um, a meeting of transdisciplinary educators. We, are, we were in the age of multidisciplinary education where each one of us had a discipline and we were all very involved in our discipline, kind of honing it and being the king of that discipline and pushing forth what we knew from our disciplines. And hopefully with this new era, we're getting closer to a transdisciplinary event where disciplinarians from other disciplines are going to inform us to better teach the student. And that's the first premise. The second premise, so that I do sound hopeful today, um, is that thanks to the dialogue between classroom professionals and neuroscientists or scientists who uh, study the brain and brain imaging, the findings continue to reaffirm that cognitive skill training works and that depending on which cognitive skill training program, this might have effects on both cognitive performance and academic achievement. I'll summarize that by stating something that Jagie et al., a group of researchers have done, um, saying that training in cognitive um, abilities can be effective and actually long-lasting. They, in fact, propose that future research should not focus on whether it works or not, but on how, what does it work on, which effects does it have, and especially which transfer effects does it have on academics. And I can't agree more. And like, Dr., uh, and like Mr. Stark has said before, um, this is what really pushed me into going and actually finding the answers myself. And I've sat where you sat, where I listened to many educators and many controversies happening between educators and other professionals about, is there any truth to this? Is there any hope that we can take this home and we could actually empower parents and children? Is there any long-lasting effects? Will there be a chance that we will change the students and close achievement gaps? Well, I looked at our, at our statistics in the United States. And out of the 13.4% of children who are, who are receiving special education, 5.2% of them are children with learning disabilities. And that, that accounts for about 40% of the students who receive special education in, in the US. And learning disabilities in math, reading, and, and or writing. Now, the re if, when we take a look at the reading process, and Dr. Pat Wolf actually talked about it a lot, you can see um, here um, through the slide that many key cognitive uh, processes have been identified for the purpose of a child being able to decode, to be fluent or to comprehend. And visualization, the directionality of text, being able to hold information for a moment and then manipulate it later once I'm done reading a paragraph and then kind of reading the next paragraph and putting it all together. That comprehension is happening thanks to those, those key um, foundational cognitive processes. But now imagine all those children who are sitting out there without <clears throat> strength within these weak cognitive processes um, at the onset. This could be an exasperating experience for them. Added to it, the lack, the lack of self-assurance and the lack of persistence or desire to persist on task. Now, when we look at uh, mathematics, it's no different. Actually, Dr. Ansari, who's a neurologist and who presented at the Learning and the Brain Conference, he received an award uh, for his contribution in the discovery of those brain networks that are involved in mental ar arithmetic and in that ability to develop that good number sense that we want our children to have, the visualization of patterns, daughtery, all those good things that we want to have, and identified actually the structural differences in math disorders. 
All of that is keying us to the fact that there are some brain processes that are actually the learning tools for us to be able to do those STEM disciplines, whether it be just reading, math, social studies, and all that stuff. So I looked at our population of students with specific learning disabilities, and I asked myself, is there a pattern? Do, is there a, an, are there a number of uh, processes that are found to be common among all students with learning disabilities? And as we know, it's a, it's a wide variety. Um, Evelyn Johnson, who actually I found out later that it was Evelyn, the person who actually did this meta-analysis, and she happened to be my professor of statistics uh, when, when I was <laughs> taking a course at Walden University. And I'll, I'll take this time actually to thank Dr. Taylor, who first um, inspired me with this entire bridge of disciplines back there at Teachers College Columbia University. And then Dr. Birnbaum, who has been my dissertation chair and who's been so empowering, uh, notwithstanding the enormous controversy I had when I wanted to conduct my experimental design study. <laughs> so, um, and I found through the meta-analysis uh, that was uh, put together that the five uh, cognitive processes that you see out there have, have been found to be common uh, to children with learning disabilities. And perhaps some who have math disability have more of the, verb of the visual working memory than the verbal working memory. But that being said, these are the common patterns. And I pulled on the theoretical support um, um, that was actually stated by Flanagan and Harrison and so many others that I cannot, cannot state today. But I'll just stay, say that researchers agree that in order to minimize the gap that students who are struggling in a classroom, and in this case, children with SLD, we need to have an overall cognitive ability. And an overall intellectual ability is a likely requisite. And when I see that, I ask myself, is there anything that we can do to spur up, to stimulate this overall cognitive ability? And that's what set me up to conduct the study. And I, exact, and I went ahead to answer the questions that you all have in your mind. Uh, and this is only one study, so we don't know it all. And obviously, we need to replicate it and see um, the after effects as well across other populations. But I certainly wanted to know whether cognitive skill training can, in fact, work. And I searched around. And I looked for those cognitive training programs that may be based on sound neurologic neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, and key principles that we know. And I found Brainware Safari. Now, you didn't hear me say this because when I called you guys, you looked, you, I, I thought I had two heads. And no, uh, nobody wanted to work with me, but I said, I chose you because you are, I fi find you to be sound on, on key, five key principles, which I'm not even going to state, but I'll summarize it by saying that um, this program was founded on, on, on a premise that you can um, train the brain as a comprehensive unit as opposed to isolating gears or um, um, faculties and training them, zooming into attention. Well, this child has an attention issue. I'll go and see if my cognitive skill training program can actually zoom in into attention and kind of fix it. And we know that one gear works with the other gears. And I, you know, I, sh I should have brought my gear game from home. And I realized that this morning. That would have been a nice visual, um, if you remember in preschool, those gear games were the key. I kind of look at it that way, that attention has to work together with visual memory in order to make me uh, fluent and, and a fast-paced learner, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so all those neural network networks had to be connected. So the question I had is, does cognitive skill training do anything, um, have any impact, any significant impact on my cognitive performance? And if it does, does it have a different impact on different cognitive processes? And the million dollar question, does it have any impact on academic achievements? And so I, we've, we've chosen 44 participants in grades two to four, um, and we split them with randomization in an experimental group and in a control group. We uh, pre-tested them all with the Woodcock-Johnson and post-tested them as well with the Woodcock-Johnson. Johnson. Um, and we used two batteries, the cognitive battery and the brief math and reading, because we wanted to know uh, what was their academic achievement right after post-testing, right after they've done the intervention. The experimental group followed Brainware for 12 weeks. The control group had regular special ed routine as usual, business as usual, followed their CS services, their uh, related services and stuff. Now, I must m mention something. I'm a mother. I don't want anybody to tell me about um, growth that is not growth. And I don't want anybody to tell me growth that is not on a specific 
fixed interval. We all know that growth between grades one to three is very different than from three to five or from five to eight or from one, one year old to a three year old. So growth in age scores only did not seem to me like the most robust information. So I called Dr. McGrew who created the Woodcock Johnson and I said I have a problem with your scores. I just can't get my stuff going here. I have my, I have W diff scores which are fixed interval scores. How do I translate that in scores that people could understand? I don't want to use age scores. Well, he says, listen, I feel your motivation and your commitment. That was after five minutes. He didn't give me more time. <laughs> and he said, um, I will dig into my archival data on the norming sample that I've used across the United States. And I'll call my guy and get, make sure that we convert your WDIF scores into fixed interval scores that you, can, that you can then use for age equivalent scores and RPI score. And that was awesome. And I think that's what gave me back the prize of my motherhood. <laughs> and so, um, and, and um, I'm going to just explain uh, what you see here on the slide. I mean, if, even if I didn't narrate this slide at all, you would see this is a slide that always gets me the chills. But I'm going to first identify what that word means, RPI. Statistics, you mentioned that it wasn't a course that we keep the neurons for. So uh, relative proficiency index. The RPI score basically predicts the child's level of proficiency on tasks that typically developing peers would accomplish at a 90% proficiency level. So for example, a child who has a 60% RPI level means that he's um, doing, completing this task with a 60% proficiency level that other peers, his age peers would complete at a 90% range. So this gives me kind of a proficiency difference or increase. When I look at the slide, it's clear that the intervention group, in this case Brainware Safari, had a significant impact on the effects on the students in the intervention group. Let's look at the GIA, which that's the general intellectual ability. This is what we wanted to minimize if you recall from that quote. It went from 60% to 89%, a little less than 90% proficiency score. And that proficiency level is what we expect out of typically developing children. And that was just in 12 weeks. My heart still beats, and I will never forget the face of this little boy. He wasn't the only one. There were so many other children, obviously. I pre-tested and post-tested all of them. But they were squinting, having a hard time through the task at pre-assessment. I've watched them. I've watched them at the post-assessment. They were breezing through it. And I still remember the words, so I put them down because I took my notes while I was post-testing. I did it! I did it, Ms. Zara! And I even bit, beat the timer! Now, in terms of academics, that's our question. Does this transfer, does this entire cognitive ability and stimulation or um, higher performance, does it translate into academic growth as well? The intervention group became 31% more proficient in reading and 28 more percent in math at post-assessment. That's just about 30% more than they were just three months prior. Their counterparts uh, became only 1% more proficient in reading and 4% more in math. And although we did not close the achievement gap entirely, the students were able to read and to do math with 30% more ease. And that was really, um, that, that was the excitement. That was just the excitement, and it's so significant. Now, I just want to share some news. Yesterday, I got a call that finally they've approved and they affirmed that we can come back to see whether those actual effects are maintained after nine months. Um, you know, that they're not on brainware, but they've been in the classroom. And the teachers have reported and emailed me time and again, which I said I'm going to share with brainware um, at some point when I can compile everything. Just their data, what, they, what they're feeling. You know, the byproducts of this is all that motivation. Now they can do it. They feel good about it. There's other things that are coming up beyond these slides, and I'm not going to take your time to say it, but just to see that children are finally happy to learn and to be in the classroom because they themselves are aware that they have an increased capacity to learn, that to me means the world as a mom, but to all of us as educators and leaders of our society. And hopefully in this era of, of neuroscience, educational neuroscience, we can um, get this everywhere. So just to take a quick look at, remember I told you that I wanted to see whether it did a, a differential uh, impact on certain cognitive processes. Look at this chart. I mean, again, other people react to charts differently, but I, I look at it and I say, almost every measure has something above 90% or just about 90%. We've closed the 
cognitive gaps for children with SLD just in 12 weeks. That's mind-boggling. Now to look at the data in grade equivalents, but now I'm happy because it's, in, it's based on equal interval squares. In terms of um, cognitive ability, the, this growth translates in 2.8 grade equivalents. So that means they grew by 2.8 grades, if you want to say, if there was a way of saying that. And 0.8 grade in reading and one full grade in math. Now the control group did 0.1 month grade increase 0.2 grade level increase. That means one or two months increase, while the other ones did eight or 12 months increase in reading and math in just 12 weeks. I believe that those are staggering results that perhaps can talk to all of us, and the implications are so clear. We're all here in the business of empowering our country, and we know that in order to do that, we, it all depends on how well we educate and empower our children. Mr. Stark uh, mentioned it very clearly that the educational reform, teacher accountability, new assessments, uh, everything that's related to the new ed reform are all necessary efforts. They're, they're actually what we call the what part of education, but I think today, today what we've addressed is the how part. How do we get all those students with different cognitive strengths who attend the same instruction in the same school and sit next to each other to be all ready and to achieve at the same grade level expectations that we have for them? And the answer is a resounding blend. Let's just blend. We're all proud of our own discipline. So let's blend, let's share. It's a transdisciplinary look and it could happen in this era. We might call it educational neuroscience. I call it, it's everybody. This world is for everyone. So let's just keep on adding neuroscience. Perhaps enter it at an initial level, even in summer school, before children get to school, so they can have higher cognitive strengths. And if someone is already in special ed, well then, for sure, put it in there and, put, and include it in our teacher training programs. I'm a big advocate and in my program, it's there. Hopefully I will write an article to uh, NYS AT, um, again, about including it. Uh, but certainly, for those who are right before getting referred to special education, like those who are in RTI, response to intervention, or in Title I, this is a key answer. So all we're asking is really that flexibility in using the funding, perhaps. Districts and schools have the funding. Perhaps they could make the choices, and they can make those informed decisions about where to spend their money, or perhaps what to add and what to blend. Let, the, let them be the recipe makers and, and blend what needs to be blend, blended. And in terms of research, I can adv advocate more for more research so we can get to know more and we can get to derive from all the, advancement, the advances in brain imaging and in heart science to inform teaching and to finally have a better <coughs> chance or a stronger chance to close the achievement gap in our educational system in the U.S. Thank you all. Okay, uh, we're running a few minutes over, so I do appreciate uh, those of you that have um, found it compelling enough to uh, listen a little further. I think the next question you probably want to ask, okay, all right, this, this stuff is real. Uh, we have research to support, and we have a lot more. This is just one particular study that we've chosen. We have tons of studies. But next, okay, Roger, how does this look in a real classroom? How does this work in the battlefield where things must take place on the ground? Well, we're going to have a superintendent here. He's the first superintendent in the world to mandate a comprehensive digital neuroscience-based program in his school district, district-wide, second grade through 12th grade. So I admire his courage, because he was the first. I think Martin Luther King says, faith is when you take a step and you never see the stairway. So he certainly had faith, but he has a unique understanding, and what he was able to do in his district, I think we can replicate around the world. Without further ado, Mr. Ron Kraft. Thank you. Um, absolutely my pleasure to be here today. Um, it's been very um, educational for me. I'm the practitioner. I'm the guy in the trenches. I'm the guy that's committed to stay in the trenches, and my commitment is to poor rural America. Um, that's my background. That's where I come from, um, and I believe all students can and will learn. It's not lip service, folks. I probably gave it lip service for the first 15 years of my educational career. Um, congratulations to Sarah. She's got four kids. We started out with four, and God gave us two more, two to adopt, um, one ten, one eight. The ten-year-old, when we got him, they told us he was cognitively impaired. My background's in special education, and so is my wife's. 
It's one thing to talk about all kids being able to learn and all kids will learn um, when you leave the school at the end of the day and you get in your nice vehicle and you go home. When you tuck them in, you kiss them goodnight, they sit next to you at the table, they ride next to you in the car, and they're not achieving at the same level as their siblings. Um, it's gut check time, folks. If you're gonna be a professional, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna live what you give lip service to, it's time to change the game. We learned more from Kevin um, than we did in uh, however many years of education my wife and I um, had. What's been reinforced from Pat and Sarah this morning, um, we were able to learn along the way um, with the help of a person that's a speech and language pathologist in special ed, because he did the research in regards to some programs. But what I have to say today is all kids can and will learn. And we're going to show you some data in regards to how we got rid of learning disabilities in a district. And you can say, if you got money, you can do anything. Folks, I'm talking the first district had about 80% economically disadvantaged. And the district I'm in today, 100% of our kids get free and reduced lunch. Okay? And so we're talking about what was the industrial age, where we were happy with 60 or 70% of our kids being able to attain. We really didn't want the 30% that went to work in factories to really be able to think. We wanted them to be able to do what they were told to do. They were the robot of that era. Um, now it's the information age, and, and uh, although I don't believe with ev everything about No Child Left Behind, God bless the people that had enough backbone to put it in place. Because it got us off in ground zero in the trenches in education. No more excuses. None. The excuse was everybody except the practitioners that were providing the services because everybody blamed everybody else. Also, uh, although I believe we have some work to do with NCLB, um, thanks for the step in the right direction. And so now with the information age, there's a level of accountability, but also with the information age, there's the ability to share strategies, skills, um, practices, um, and the utilization of, uh, of what our kids tie into like never before. So for us, at the, in the trench level, we've got to figure out what's legitimate and what's a scam because some people just want to make money. Um, they're in it for the money. They're not in it for all students to, to learn, and they don't really believe that all kids can and will learn. They're in it for the dollar. Um, we ha in the information age, our kids are entertained. We know that. So how do we take a product that they view as entertaining and we view as valuable? Um, what, what can we use that'll generate measurable results because that's part of um, No Child Left Behind. That's trickled down to every state. It doesn't matter where. So how, how do we utilize the time that we have? Um, if we go back to Doc Lazat's research, um, opportunity to learn time on task. With that time that we have, how do we generate the results that we have to be um, accountable to? Um, patterns and abilities to think. You heard Pat talk about it this morning. You heard Sarah talk about it. I'm going to give you the um, practitioner in the trenches um, definition or, or, or theory behind it. What is reading? Isn't reading a pattern? Come on, let, let's cut right down to what it is. When we have the rules for um, vowels, when we have the consonant blends, and then we put that together, what is that, folks? It's a stinking pattern. It's in its sim most simplistic form. That's what it is. What are rhyming words? Cat, hat, sat. What are they? They're a pattern. Okay? That's the foundation of it from a practitioner's standpoint, absolutely reinforced by the research from my perspective this morning. What's math? We're going to count by twos. What is that? How about if we multiply by twos? How about if we divide by that? What's order of operation? Um, Pre-algebra, what are the rules in regards to multiplying and dividing fractions? Those are all patterns. So what's algebra one, two, trig, pre-calc, calc? What is it? They're patterns. How do our brains see patterns? What's legitimate? What's not legitimate? Um, we talk about um, behaviors and environment and safe in the classroom that social component of it, um, how kids act and behave, isn't that reinforced patterns by what they observe, what they do, and what's reinforced? 
um, the district I used to be in, um, located in the thumb of Michigan, rural, um, agriculturally related, um, a little over 70% of our, our families economically disadvantaged, um, and we had some struggles and uh, some challenges for us. Um, we did a study, my speech pathologist who was a board member um, in our district, when he quit being a board member in our district, I had enough respect and regard for him as a professional to ask that the ISD um, place him in our district. He came to me one day and said, um, I think I found something because we talked about it openly. Um, we were absolutely assertive with it in regards to all can and will. He came to me and said, um, I want to do this. I want to volunteer after school to take 10 kids. There's a program that I want to use. Here's the, the studies that I've done. Here's what's out there, da 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 I said, okay, Curtis, what do you want from me? He said, I want money, and I want you to run interference for me. Okay, rock on, let's do it. How much are we talking about? He gives me the number. Um, we start the process. There's the data that we got in a 12-week period. And so um, the intellectual age growth is, is down the left side. Um, the 10 students um, are across the right. Use the Woodcock Johnson, he did it. Um, as a superintendent, I go, okay. If we can do this with a cross-section of our community that are, that's the most needy, um, I'm not the brightest bulb in the race. Um, that's good enough for me to get rocking. And so um, well, I went to my bosses and said, um, I want to do this across the board. And they said, really? I said, yeah. So we did a webinar where for 45 minutes, my bosses did Brainware Safari. And at the end of that portion of the board meeting, they said, um, we support you as long as we don't have to do it. <laughs> okay, we're in. And so we started it, and what we did is we took our teachers, we didn't, we didn't take our students and send them to the computer lab with a paraprofessional, um, a certified teacher aide or anyone else. We trained our teachers through a webinar and they went there. You say, Ron, why did we do that? Because it was my hope that what they learned by doing Brainware themselves, what they learned by helping our students do that, um, they would begin to take some of, of what they learned, strategies, thought process, planning, and integrate it back into the classroom. Um, and that's what we've seen. We talk about money, we talk about students, we talk about them getting it. About 18% of our students, um, before we started into it, and I've got to say this, if you brought kids in and gave them brain, did brain work tomorrow, you're not going to change it. It's part of a system. It's a piece of the puzzle, but it's a huge piece of the puzzle. When we started in our district, about 18% of our students in special education. Um, after that fact, five. Um, the spending in regards to it before and after the fact. The bottom line is, our kids have a chance um, if they can read. They have a chance if they can think. To me, that's what math is. Math isn't really about numbers. It's about logical, sequential process of thinking. And so, for me in the trenches, what Brainware does is it deals with patterns. That's what our world is. I mentioned earlier my son Kevin, our son Kevin. Um, Kevin was labeled cognitively impaired when we got him. Um, Kevin, you're going to do this. Okay. He got 130 units into it and he said, I'm not doing it anymore. Because the background Kevin came from, it was when things get rough, you quit. I said, uh, okay, chum, you're not graduating from high school without it. And I walked away. Um, Kevin graduated a year early from high school. An A one semester in Algebra two, an A minus the other semester. His goal was to be a Marine. He serves our country today um, in San Diego, California, in the area of communications. I spoke with him last night to reaffirm that I could use his name today. He called me after his, uh, after his uh, training, um, his communication school, and said, hey, oh man, I hate to say this to you. I said, what's that? He said, you know, the, the brainware program that I didn't want to do, and I did, we've talked about a lot of times, it's all about patterns. I said, yeah, what about it? He said, that's what my school is in the core. He said, communication school, Dad, is nothing more than a school about patterns. Because when I lay things out, there's a pattern to lay it out right on. How many other careers, how many other things that we do, how much of a, from a social emotional standpoint, 
of what we do and the choices we make revolve around patterns. From a practitioner's standpoint, it's one thing. Listening to these um, ladies this morning is nothing but reinforcing to me. What's a scam? What's not a scam? How can we engage our kids to do it? Then how can we as practitioners um, build the relationships that we need to with our kids to have them finish it? There's 168, I think, 165, 168 units. Um, I challenge you to do it also because you're not gonna cruise through 168, guaranteed. I got a lady that works for me that was a 36 on her ACT, she can't finish it. She's two away and it drives her crazy. You know something, she's a special ed teacher and she's good and I'm glad she can't finish it. You know why? She looks at our population and the students that she deals with a little bit differently because now there's something that she has difficulty doing. You think that won't make her a better educator? Of course it will. Um, is it only for special education? It is not. Um, I had a young lady in the beach that had a 29 on her ACT, um, four point. The kid that was in front of her, the gentleman that was in front of her to be the uh, valedictorian was 33, 32, 33, and a 4.2. She couldn't, she took the test a zillion times. She came to me and said, this is really important to me. Um, is there anything that you think I could do? I said, there's two things that I'd suggest, and we were just starting into the brainware at that time. I said, um, you have time if you get after it every day to do the brainware and complete it. And, and um, there was a, another um, program that we were um, doing um, in regards to, it was a, it was a decoding deal. And, uh, and so she did both of them together. She stayed after school, didn't fit in her schedule, she did it. Um, she took the ACT when she could, 34 or 35. A lot of people said, well, that was luck. I went to her and said, I'll pay for you to take the ACT again. I'll write the check. You fill out the form. I'll do it out of my personal checkbook. I'll write the check. You take the ACT again. I want to see if you can replicate that score. She did. The ACT is what? It's a reading test. The majority of it, right? And it deals with the math with Algebra 1. What's that? It's a stinking pattern. Right? And so listening to these young ladies, we didn't know that. Listening to these young ladies today, doesn't it all come together? It makes sense. They're talking about how the brain sees patterns from a research standpoint, and we're saying from a practitioner standpoint, yeah, we got it. It does. And so how can then we take what I saw with Pat's work this morning with the specific parts of the brain, not just with the Brainware Safari, but what we do from an instructional planning and delivery standpoint to get all our kids, if that's what we're interested in. Are we interested in doing it, or are we interested in giving lip service to it? Roger talked this morning about how do we fund it. Um, I deal in dysfunctional districts. I deal with districts that are broke that the state wants to close. Um, they can all be fixed, every one of them. I don't need more money. I just need a little flexibility with what I have. I know if I'm not accountable and our kids don't attain, I'm going down the road. The way the law is today, I'm going down the road, my principal's going down the road, and half my staff's going down the road. I'm good with that. I'm okay with that. And if I'm gonna be okay with that, let me spend my money the way I know I wanna spend it. What we're doing in the district that I'm in right now, it's a small rural district with a $4.5 million budget. We were three quarters of a million dollars in debt when I got there with two years to get out. Every one of my students in grades three, eight right now are doing Brainware Safari. Figured out a way to fund it. How do you do it when you're broke? What's your priority? Is it about all kids learning? How are you gonna do it? They're all doing it right now. Not all of my high school is doing it right now simply because I inherited a situation where I had so many kids that were behind and this and that, but I have a number of high school kids doing it, this doing it right now. So when they finish in grades three through eight in the district that I'm in right now, we're gonna do what Pat talked about. We're gonna do it long before um, I heard Pat say it this morning. We're gonna do what we call spiral. They're doing it five days a week right now for 45 minutes a day. How do you build it into the schedule? What's your priority? They're doing it um, five days a week, 45 minutes a day right now. When those kids complete that, they're gonna to go to three days a week. How long is it gonna take them to do it the second time around? Then they're gonna to go to two days a week. Then they're gonna to go to one. 
after we see what the data is, we'll determine if they do it once a year. We'll get that figured out along the way. But if we know, based on the data with Marzano and Reeves and others, that spiraling is a huge deal, why don't we spiral this? If we listen to what these two ladies talked about this morning in regards to patterns, in general and in special education, why aren't we doing it? I don't need more money, folks. I just need freedom to spend mine the way I want. I'm a Title I school. It's difficult. Things filter down. I'm, I'm very respectful about this. I don't want your job on Capitol Hill. That's why I'm not here. I'm in the trenches. I'm in rural America, and that's where I'm staying. Um, I know there has to be accountability. I know there's scams. But if, that, if one of the things that we're allowed to spend our money on, federal dollars, if we're a Title I school, is that it just became a lot easier for me, and I just took a whole bunch of excuses away from my colleagues that I'm trying to get other districts to do the same thing I'm doing with. Yeah, there's people at the state level. I've got a field rep. That person's overworked. It's tough. Roger talked about it earlier. There's X amount of dollars, and we're not going to get any more. And so if the feds can mandate NCLB, I'm good with that. I believe they have the ability to allow this product, which is legit, to be an expense. And I'm going to tell you what I said already to the guy that owns the company. Um, be ready to negotiate a price. Um, if we use federal dollars for it, and it's not going to be the price that you're selling, that you're charging right now. Wait a minute, you're negotiating. Uh, I'm not <laughs> negotiating here, but I'm laying it on the line. I told him that. I told him that a, a zillion times, and I told him that last night. This is a product um, that works. I'm not a salesman. I'm not on their payroll. I'll never be on their payroll. This is a product that serves kids, from a practitioner's standpoint, from a researcher's standpoint. It's the tip of the iceberg, folks. If we believe all can and will, we've got to think differently. We've got to be willing to be a risk taker, but we have to demand performance. That's the bottom line. All kids can and will. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ron. Um, we're running a few minutes over. We are going to stay here. If any of you would like, to, anyone would like to ask a question. Uh, for many of our panelists, or anyone, or myself, we're more than willing to answer your questions. We want to make sure you walk away with what you wanted when you leave. Um, I would just like to make one comment about uh, Ron Kraft, his uh, um, director of speech and language pathologist that found us. Uh, he made a comment to us. He said, uh, I asked him, I said, well, look, exactly, uh, Dr. Barr, what would you suggest and recommend to other folks that are considering and looking at this and making these tough decisions? He said, Roger, I'm going to tell you one thing, and I'll say this anytime, anywhere. If the federal government can mandate no child left behind and fund it, they should mandate Brainware Safari for every child in America and fund it. Thank you very much for your time.